My name is Katie Wollstonecroft. I'm from the University of Manchester, and I'm going to talk to you today about standard operating procedures in systems biology. So we'll start with some definitions of what I mean by standard operating procedures. So an established procedure to be followed in carrying out a given operation or in a given situation. A specific procedure or set of procedures so established. Uh, lots of different people use SOPs, and at first glance, they don't have very much in common. So people like the fire department, military, clinical studies, software engineering, food manufacturing. Um, really, it's anybody who has to think about doing things mindfully um, that needs to use uh, standard operating procedures. So in the fire department, people have to be able to ensure that the safety of the firemen is paramount. Um, in clinical studies and drug development, you have to be able to go back through previous experiments, you have to go back through your whole catalogue of proof that that drug that is eventually coming to market will be safe. Um, in software engineering, you maybe have particular procedures that you go through to test your software before you send it out to market. In systems biology, uh, we have standard operating procedures um, in the same sense as you do in clinical and drug development studies. Uh, it's all about being able to consistently um, describe the science that you're doing. Um, so everyone is already familiar with laboratory protocols. An SOP is a laboratory protocol that has been agreed upon across a large consortium of scientists or a distributed consortium of scientists. And in systems biology, this is becoming typically the way people work. People no longer work with just the person in their laboratory. They work with people from uh, across Europe, across the world. Um, so you need to be able to compare your data. You need to be able to compare your experiments. And SOPs are a good way of ensuring that that's possible. So uh, laboratory protocols allow you to understand other people's experiments, understand other people's results, and properly evaluate the data that, that they present to you. Um, if you want to publish your data, then of course you need to be able to publish the method used to produce that data, and it's good scientific practice. Uh, what you get uh, on top of that with SOPs are this ability to share across large groups. Uh, so you can make agreements within a project, maybe about particular strains to use in particular experiments, particular conditions that you will always adhere to. Um, it's easier when new people join the project then to train them, to show them exactly how things will be done. What happens when you don't use standard operating procedures? Well, it can be a catastrophic uh, mistake. Uh, this is a news report from 1999 from CNN, and this is about the loss of an $125 million Mars orbiter. Now, uh, the people in this experiment were actually trying to follow standard operating procedures, but they didn't do it in enough detail. There were two groups of scientists. One group of scientists was using an imperial uh, measurement, and another group of scientists was using metric. So... Um, their measurements were off, and it cost a lot of money, and it was very embarrassing. So not only do you have to adopt SOPs, you have to really believe uh, and follow everything to the letter. So an SOP is a common framework that will allow you to describe what you're going to do, exactly what you're going to do, and exactly how you're going to do it. Uh, so it's a good idea if you have a consistency in your presentation, um, so that everybody coming to a new SOP will, will know exactly what to expect and where to find information within the document. Um, you can also think about your SOPs as the document for data sharing as well. It's um, a description of what kind of data you're going to generate ultimately. So you can start thinking about how that data will be presented to other experimentalists, other people further down the pipeline, for example, uh, data analysis type people. Um, standard operating procedures really shouldn't change once they've become established in a particular consortium and particular project, but sometimes there are reasons to alter them slightly. Maybe somebody's come up with a better way of doing something that will be more cost-effective, more 
um, more efficient in some way. Um, now, if that happens, it has to be agreed upon by everybody. It's no good if some people start doing something new and other people follow the old SOP. It has to be everybody moving together to the same new version. Um, so you have to make sure that this is the case. Everybody starts using the new version as soon as that new version is available. And record very carefully which version of a SOP was used in which experiment. Um, SOPs need to be accessible to everybody on the project. So uh, it's no good really keeping them in your laboratory notebook, in your lab, if you're working with lots of people from lots of different places. Um, if you want to be able to discuss and ask questions about particular SOPs, then uh, some kind of central place where all of that discussion can go as well is quite a useful feature. Uh, so you might want to think about putting your SOPs up on some kind of shared wiki within your project, within your consortia, or even some kind of public uh, document store or online repository. And there are already some in existence. Uh, so for example, Open Wetware is a wiki which uh, allows you to upload any kind of protocol you like in any format. Nature Protocols is more of a publication mechanism for publishing your protocols, so they're actually reviewed by somebody before they're uh, included in the site. And then there are sort of smaller SOP repositories for particular communities. For example, there's one for the metagenomic community. This is a screenshot of Open Wetware. Uh, as you can see, it looks like any other kind of wiki. Things are categorized, you can tag them, you can comment on things, which means also that members of the public can then comment on your protocols, on your SOPs, so that might help you improve them in the future. Uh, this is a screenshot of Nature Protocols. As you can see, it's much more formal, it's much more structured, uh, and there are advantages to this approach as well. So with the open wetware model, you get the uh, added value from the community, uh, and you can find things by simple searching mechanisms, simple tagging mechanisms. Um, but there's no standard way of referring to reagents, no standard way of referring to equipment. So it's quite easy to get lost and not understand when two protocols are actually really talking about the same things. Uh, with the Nature Protocols format, you have a specific structure that people follow every single time. This is the, an outline of the structure here. Um, the things outlined in pale blue are actually the optional features, uh, but every other document will have all of these different parts to it. Um, and so it's much more structured, it's easier to find things, it's easier to compare Nature Protocols SOPs. Um, coming back to the data interface, you have to think about what data will be produced during your experiment. What are the standard ways of naming those uh, pieces of data? If it's a gene list, do you want to name those genes using um, your own local names for those genes, or do you want to use some kind of community-agreed standard naming scheme? Uh, and the same for proteins and metabolites and things like this. Sometimes there'll be a standard way of representing certain types of data. There'll be a minimum information model checklist, for example. So if you have microarray data, you might want to um, specify in your SOP that that data should be represented in a Miami compliant form. And this is all about ensuring that you have consistency in your results. So um, sometimes you have several different community um, community standard naming schemes that you can choose from, as long as you stick to one and you're consistent, then that is uh, a good approach. So to summarize, um, an SOP is a necessary part of uh, the way that people now work, especially in systems biology, in large consortia where people are spread around the world, spread around different countries. Um, it ensures consistency. It allows you to produce comparable results uh, and ensures that exactly the same experiments are carried out each time. And so all of this feeds into helping you produce reproducible science. <laughs>